Hi, everybody, and welcome to the first in the 2019-2020 lecture series that is sponsored by the Department of Art and the Center for New Art. And do we get money from the college? Yeah, I think we do. Maybe a little bit from the dean. Uh, lecture series in which we bring visiting artists in. Oftentimes they do projects with us, and uh, so they're here sometimes for as long as a week, sometimes they're only here for the day. I would like to introduce our speaker today. <laughs> our speaker is Ron Labore. He joins us from Western Carolina University. The work of Ron Labore has been displayed in museums, special project spaces, not-for-profits, and galleries. <clears throat> in cities such as Los Angeles, Chicago, Taiwan, Japan, Memphis, Tennessee, Sedalia, and St. Louis, Missouri. His exhibition after the CE at the University of Missouri was reviewed in Art in America magazine. The website of Peter Miller Gallery in Chicago describes Labore's art as merging abstract painting and a pseudo-scientific method to create a visual archive of popular culture. This method appropriates existing laws found in sciences like the law of superposition and the artist's sculptural mixed media mechanisms. The mediums, used, the mediums used range from the digital to plastic, aluminum auto lacquer, decals and marker, which are all metaphoric of pop popular culture. <coughs> Abstract painting's beautiful object collides with a color-coded archive based on mass culture elements like television, cinema, comic books, and advertising. Major group exhibitions have included Terra Incognito at the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis, uh, which also included in the exhibition the artists Julie Mertu, uh, Lordi Rodriguez, and Mark Lombardi. Without further ado, please help join me in welcoming Ron Labarek. Hello, thank you, thank you, thank you, Michael. Thank you uh, to the, the school for having me. It's a pleasure to come, a privilege to come and talk to you all. Um, I'm originally from, I'm, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, I moved to North Carolina about uh, nine years ago. And um, si since that time, I've been doing a lot of traveling uh, globally and uh, just presenting my work, and I wanted to, I pre presented this uh, lecture before a couple different times, but uh, there's always, uh, it's always building because I build an archive, and the archive is, uh, is a body of work that I started 20 years ago, I just build onto. And it's, uh, uh, the subjects are similar in terms of um, uh, pop culture, mass culture, they tend to uh, oscillate between fact and fiction, uh, high and low. You know, so all of those things are brought into an equivalency on a, on a, on a level plane. So I don't see um, high art and low art in my work. It's not uh, approached at as differently, but on the same plane. In the same way with truth and fact, myth, uh, legend. Um, so uh, this lecture is called Globalization, Time, and the Position of the Artist. And um, I, the reason why I talk about globalization is um, it's a, it's a model of force that, that defines us today. It's one of those uh, factors that defines the globe. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of artists think in the micro, and I tend to look at a macro uh, view. Um, and so I look at larger things like forces of globalization, um, time, uh, relative memory and archive, and then the position of the artist, and that's you know your identity. Um, um, your opinion as a position to have, uh, your, your action, what, what actions you take as a position, and then um, where are you on the timeline? You know, I'm, I, I exist right now, uh, and then there's been time well past, and there's plenty of time in the future. Um, so, it, and then of course your physical actual location. And like I said, I came from St. Louis, Missouri, and I now live in North Carolina. And uh, the transition was very interesting definitely changed me in terms of um, understanding another culture. Uh, the southern uh, culture is a, little, a lot different than uh, where I grew up in St. Louis in the Midwest. Globalization is a model of a world picture. Um, it is a world picture derived from several factors, but specifically the ideas of religion, mass culture, economic power, instant communication, and entertainment. These are the, the forces at work. 
<clears throat> that tend to spread, uh, disseminate cultural information, uh, cultural power. And then the world picture is only a moment in time. And I think that that's something different from, uh, say, the modernist point of view and the metamodernist point of view, is that the modernist point of view would be kind of locating a, an answer, where the metamodernist position might be that that, that answer is fluid and uh, it can evaporate. Um, <clears throat> so I'm interested in how uh, we tend to, uh, our, our cultures uh, cross and uh, spread, uh, spread out. And, and this is a really uh, interesting image to me. This was, um, it's called Moving with the Times, the figure of Soviet soldiers at the base of a Soviet army monument have been transformed into superheroes in Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria. Um, and you can see how our, our cultural identifiers of color systems uh, and patterns can transform what might be a soldier uh, into a more Western iconographic image. And with that comes along uh, identity and uh, the, uh, certain ideals that are, are filled up within it. So it's interesting to see these, these combinations worldwide and how, uh, uh, how they seep in. Uh, While well, I was in Budapest last year and I happened across this sculpture, which is a very interesting thing. This is um, uh, Columbo, uh, who was a, a fictitious character, um, is, is in this, it's kind of hard to go find this sculpture. It's kind of out of the way. Um, and they have him in bronze in Budapest. Now, the interesting thing is Peter Falk, uh, his last name is a famous Hungarian name. And, but they don't know if he's actually related to the Falks, but they have, uh, well, you know, hung Hungary has been uh, uh, invaded and occupied and invaded and occupied over and over again to the point where what their... Um, their cultural identity is is very fluid, and they don't they don't have it in a concrete way. So, this is uh, one of those examples where they've pulled someone famous into their history, uh, not quite knowing whether or not he's actually related to the folks. But I think that that's interesting as well how a TV character can then uh, add or contribute to the culture of another country that had no connection to it whatsoever at the beginning. So. It's not about a constant, but a moment of change. The picture formed through both scientific measurement and those social ideas that are less measurable. And I think that that's why it's important for the artists to be involved in the world picture, because we are uniquely qualified for both of these types of research, both the analytical research and the more subjective things that, that um, art can only describe. And uh, models like a, a hurricane, the force of a world picture generates a vortex of displacement, reorientation, like, uh, like Peter Falk, right? Uh, reassessment of what the world is and what is becoming. So this is, uh, this is a picture of the United States. And you see Fred there at the, the border of Colorado and Utah. It's the only, only city in the country named Bedrock is in Colorado at the, uh, so that's part of the research, right? We have to do the research. Well, what do we know? And wh what I know is that uh, if Fred lived in the United States, he would have lived in Bedrock in Colorado. And so I was thinking I, maybe I should, how do I come, how do I form this out? What do I make? So I was interested in maps and I started making these maps of places that fiction and reality overlapped. And it was kind of an easy recipe. Um, and so I would make these maps. This is uh, Fred Flintstone in Bedrock, Colorado. It's four foot by five foot, resin and autourethane on aluminum. This one, this version's in 2011. I've made three versions of it. Um, surfboard resin on aluminum. I use aluminums and resins and uh, fake felt, and now I'm using uh, high density urethane foam to make my work because it's like today. It's not necessarily a metaphor, it's more like a simile, it's like today. Um, <clears throat> and I appropriate certain rules in order to organize or compose my work. I tend to keep a hands off. So I do a lot of spraying and pouring and not a lot of what might be considered the artist genius of making with the hands and the touch and the painting process. So uh, mine, are, mine are often planned out and then uh, produced through jigs 
uh, uh, technology to help create it, and we'll get more into that in just a second. Uh, I also worked as an archaeologist, and that's the, another reason why I think about material, is that when I would dig up a bowl, I could take a look at what that bowl was made out of, what type of ceramics, what was included in the ceramics, and we could date it. So my art objects are, they understand, they're reflective of themselves as objects of this time, and therefore they're made out of certain materials. Okay, so uh, the value of a world picture. Having a world picture creates a reassessment of what we know and the world as what the world can be. And um, currently we think about the world picture as clear, realistic, containing searchable information, and apocalyptic. Now the top three you might understand. You have, you have access to information that you can do searches for, uh, you, can, uh, you can see uh, fact through, uh, through photographs, um, so it's realistic. Uh, but the apocalyptic, some people don't understand that, but that is because the world has become so small in terms of technology that we can see what's going on on the other side of the planet instantaneously. And if anything negative happens on the planet, instantaneously it is presented to us. So we see the world smaller and more chaotic than ever before. Had we not have that technology, we would be in this location, in our position, uh, without an understanding of that. And the world might just seem rather calm around us. Uh, but technology and globalization allow us to see that as more uh, dynamic and uh, apocalyptic. Um, so world pictures defined by Heidegger is, is uh, metaphor, figures, Pictures of globalization during ancient, modern, and postmodern times. And uh, we're going to, I'm, I'm working quickly because I know we have about an hour, but globalization, ancient, uh, the world view outside of the local and the self, there was no real view, right? It was, it was very local. Um, you didn't know what was going on on the other side of the world. Um, you didn't, uh, you, you were very uh, focused on your own culture, your own community group. So here are two examples of that. And globalization in the modern period uh, uh, created pictures of uh, the world and the world as pictures with scientific research, physics, and math. And again, we were talking about, I was saying about the modernist period that it was about an answer, right? And, and then the postmodernists uh, stopped thinking about answers so much and started dissecting the answers and the power and to understand it. And then the metamodernists tried to pick those pieces up and go forward with a new narrative. Well, here in the modern world, we're looking for that, for that answer. Uh, and then a postmodern globalization, um, the globe, defined as we are surveillance mapping and modeling, and the globe within the model of the cosmos, heaven, hell, the art world, ethnographic regions, and class structures. Um, I've included Nelly on this. I, I got off a, a, a train in Amsterdam, my first few steps into Amsterdam that year, and this poster was there. And I was thinking about how uh, it fit really well within this, uh, this conversation uh, because one, he's in a, a micro world of the art world and the entertainment world. Um, uh, he, uh, the, the idea of class structure is evident within uh, rap in general, uh, but the idea of um, uh, showing wealth or taste uh, is a, a class structure. And then uh, the, the sunglasses for me were, were something about surveillance and trying to avoid uh, being recognized. Our, pictures of the global is, our picture of the global is known, depicted, and imagined. And so we're going to start with the known. Uh, we build a world picture through what we can measure, map, and test. That's what we know. This knowledge is always shifting, data collecting, random sampling, and mapping. So. I do that. I, I, I do some random sampling, uh, gathering of information in random ways. Uh, and uh, so this was, I found this magazine here, uh, La Journal Mickey, uh, in Paris at the Bucanista. Has anyone been uh, out by the Louvre? The, the wonderful book. I love those things. I'm sure all the tourists do. It's like little junk shops of, of books. Uh, and this was since 1952, so it's right after World War II. Right? It's, it's the rebuilding portion of uh, post-World War II history. And who do we have teaching the Europeans but Mickey Mouse? 
really, uh, I, and on television, right? Yes? That comic right there, um, was that from the uh, Karl Barks era, or was that from a latter era of Disney comics? I don't know. Good question. Good research. Do it. But the, the, the idea here is that we're seeing the ideals of America being disseminated through this, this child's comic, right? So uh, ideals and, and what we hold as important. Now, of course, we were the dominant force coming out of World War II because of the decimation of Europe. And this is a way that we were able to um, spread ourselves into the community. So I look for these things as I'm out. These are ev this is like evidentiary stuff. This is the stuff I think about with evidence. Now, this is not me, my work, but this is the work of Mark Dion, uh, the, the Tate, uh, Tim's Dig. And it's, it's a very influential piece for me. I have several artists that I, well, I, I have three, I think, in this, uh, that I look to. Um, and Dion's one of those. And what I liked about this is that they, they wandered the Thames and they would, they would gather up all the junk, everything that was there, from early time to current time. And it was all compressed into one display here, um, as you can see, and it's a display cabinet, has drawers, and everything was put with like things, organized for display. And you got a, had an understanding of the history of the place within this one catalog, this one archive of things. And it, 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 was, um, it was very simple, uh, this, this simple, just go out and pick the stuff up and bring it back and organize it and, and, and show it to people. Uh, and it says so much. So I thought that that was um, a, a, a valuable work for me. And, uh, it coincides, you know, this was, this was me working as an archaeologist. Um, I did this for uh, a little over a year after I graduated with my master's degree. I was working with maps and culture, and I thought, I need a little bit more real experience to understand what I'm doing. I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm faking it unless I really know. So I got this job and I, I was able, I was a director of site photography, which I, I, I taught a bunch of archeologists how to take pictures of holes in the ground. And um, every day was wonderful. New things would come out of the ground and we would be able to reevaluate the meaning of this site. Now this was the largest site in America at the time. It was three football fields long and it was uh, all right above East St. Louis uh, in Illinois. And uh, it was rescue archaeology. There was going to be a, uh, a highway exchange put here, like a big clover leaf. So we had an opportunity to go in and work it out. And that's where I started really fundamentally understanding my work, understanding how I could bridge my interests with fine art making. You know, you're all students, and you're all figuring out your way, right? And we all have a different way. There's no right way. You have your professors who kind of give you guidance and help, and, and I wouldn't be here uh, right now in this project if it wasn't for one of your professors saying, hey, have you ever thought about this? And um, you never know where that's going to take a, uh, take a turn, and I knew I needed this. So I went, to went into archaeology, um, and I learned a lot. This is called a feature. Anything, anything that someone did a long time ago on the ground, once we decide we're going to map it, we call it a feature. It's a location. And the feature is inscribed in this circle. It's really kind of, sometimes it's a burn pit, sometimes it's a house basin, sometimes it's a grave. We never know what it's going to be until you start working it out. And, um, and often they're just common banal things, a trash pit where they throw things in, old food bones and old broken pottery bits and whatever. And that's, that's how they got rid of their garbage. You dig a hole, stick it in, it, fill it up. Once in a while we would dig up a hole, we would find a hole that had nothing in it all the way down. We don't know why they filled, they filled it up. But anyway, this is a profile wall, okay, and a profile wall. So what you do when you go down a profile wall is you go back in time. This is the beginning, later and later, and all the way up. Just like you would in your trash can. You throw Monday's garbage in there, then you throw Tuesday's garbage and Wednesday's garbage, and then if Friday you wanted to go find out what you did on Monday, you could go, you go down there and find out. What did you eat? You could remember, right? So that's how archaeology works in terms of discovery with these features. But specifically, 
the profile is how we define it. We can look at it in terms of what it is and what might be in it. So I thought maybe I could think about that in terms of my subject matter. Right? And this goes back to, to Fred Flintstone as well. But if I took any icon, any logo color, any, any uh, popular culture subject, I might be able to reference it this way, using the law of superposition. So the feet of Superman on the bottom, his tights, his trunks, all the way up to his hair, right? And this way, um, the, the information that I am giving you is dictated through uh, appropriated subject, an appropriated law of superposition, and a process that takes my decision making out of it. Because amounts and order are all uh, set up for me. I don't have to think about that. It just is. So I would make these. And this is um, the Batman Superman team up jig. Um, and that, that's the painting up in the corner, up in the right corner. That's the map painting of it. But it came out of this tool. And um, I, found, I took the map as one of my original ones. I took the map and I found out every location where there was a metropolis and a Gotham. So there are three metropolises in the United States and then one Gotham up, uh, I think it's in Wisconsin. And then you, I would pour the colors of Superman and then Batman in the top one. And this is the, the final painting. It's called Batman Superman Team Up Number One. It's a much better movie than um, Batman v Superman. Don't Great, and it, it didn't cost as much to make this, right? <laughs> Right. Um, so it both exists as uh, a document, a historical art artifact, and an abstract painting. All right, so I'm working on all three of those levels all the time, thinking about that all the time. And that's with every piece that I wake, make. It's, it's, uh, it's a formal functioning piece of visual art. It's a communicative document of some type. Uh, and it's made of a certain material that is from now. These are my sketchbook pages. These are what my sketchbooks look like. Um, these are the 2008 Kentucky Derby winners. I, I make lists, and then I find out which horse had what colors on the jockey, or you know, and which place did they come in. And that develops the order and the color processes and the distribution. Here's another page, which I think these would be really great prints. I think that these would be kind of cool prints too. Uh, and, and so I, I, I take what we might find as mentor-mentorship, hero, heroics, friendship, companionship, domesticity, and we, can, we see that they get, those ideals get filled into uh, characters uh, that, that we can uh, all get around or get, you know, support. Uh, here again is is uh, Fred and Mickey. And so I've been doing maps, and this was a, uh, th this is a, uh, kind of like a, um, a core sample, you know, where you would dig down and you would be able to find what was on bottom all the way up through time. Same with a profile wall. And this is called uh, the History of Cartoon Icons. It's uh, auto paint on MDF with a clear coat. So the, this is uh, MDF. They're both boxes and they're airbrushed. I use a lot of airbrushing and spraying. I use spray paint, uh, car guns, uh, airbrushes, and I pour. So my hand almost never touches the canvas. It's different if I'm doing scientific drawing. Different thing. But these have um, a lot of hands off. And this is how you might be able to uh, decipher it. Uh, you have Steamboat Willie, Mickey Mouse, and Hello Kitty. As you can see, there's a, a timeline of occurrences. And each, each occurrence is a location. Each location is filled with our ideals, with what those things that we want to fill it up with. Here's another sketchbook page. You see, I'm working on the stuff with the page right next to me. I'm checking it off. It's like a list. Um, 
and I have to do a lot of research. Like I can print this out from the site, but I have to go back and watch the race, or I have to I have to uh, look up on that that racers on Bobby Labonte's website what the color of his car was at the time because they change car colors. Um, so every year it could be a different kind of race. And so these these are um, I decided to make these charts. I did maps. Uh, yeah, I did the core samples and and these charts and. The charts, this is, I made this jig, it's called the Fuzzy Bar Spray Jig. Very simple and straightforward. I just wanted to be able to use spray paint to make a fuzzy background. Um, and I, so these are you know, big wooden tables that I would make to put the paintings in to create this. And, and this would be one of the paintings. So these charts are charts of auto races. I did the Indianapolis 500 several times from different races, and each result is different. So I'm going to go back one. This was where the starting grid, where the people who started first were at the bottom, who finished first were at the bottom, who finished last would be at the top. All organized by the law of superposition. The colors are, again, appropriated from their sites. And I had no, I had, uh, no control over how they finished. So the result of the painting would be out of my hands. And this is, again, here's a. Uh, uh, 2006, and, it, and this one is how they started was behind and then how they finished was in front. So you can see that this was the car who finished first, very down here at the bottom. And this is the Pocono 500 um, in 2005. The, uh, the background is how they, they who, who uh, started and who, fin or who finished and uh, the ones on top are everyone who crashed. And this again is a uh, Surfboard resin on aluminum. So it's a, a, a bar chart of the auto races. Here are some examples of the work in, in place in a museum. So they're, they're kind of shiny and uh, plasticky. Now depicted, and that's what we know, and it, we, we know is data that we can, we can collect up and present. Uh, depicted, the depicted, the, a, we depict a world through pictures and models that then inform and define the world. We might find this picture connected by shared metaphors, art, artifice, and philosophy. So, we're, we, there are, uh, I, you know, uh, how do we depict the people uh, who run our world or who are important to us? Uh, we can, we can uh, see that. And how do they, they kind of, they intermingle, right? How do the representations in, in, intermingle? Uh, some of this is from Paris. Uh, this one, I think, was from Amsterdam. The, uh, the idea is to, to hunt down and locate this very interesting uh, cross-cultural uh, relationship. And, and here's uh, Tiger Woods. Now, I go back to this because we know Superman has a certain color system. McDonald's has a color system, right? Um, we, we instantly know these things. So when we get to Tiger Woods, he has a color system as well, right? So he's... He has his certain so This is called um, uh, Tiger Woods spe specimen quality, and it's a it's a uh, resined box in his color of his Sunday outfit. Again, the profile view, and then him poured from the feet all the way up to the top on the top. Uh, this is uh, Emmanuel Lutz uh, washing crossing the Delaware. Uh, it was done in 1851. Uh, it's a big painting. Uh, I did one. This one's called uh, the American, an American painting. And it's a dissection, a cross-section of the location of that painting using the profiles of everyone in the boat and the flag. It's, uh, uh, it's a, uh, another surfboard resin on aluminum. And it's, uh, I think it's... Uh, little over, it's about four foot long. And, you know, the, again, I'm looking at culturally important and very meaningful uh, features in order uh, to profile. Uh, paintings can be a location, a, ma a, a comic book, a television show, a movie can be a location that we all share. And the things that are in it that we share are those beliefs, like friendship, the idea of bravery, compassion, intellect. And so those are dissected in that movie 
and and uh, we understand their importance because they are the the main goal. And there are other things within the movie that, because of its time and when it was made, that could be culturally critical. Uh, but I look to the positives here and um, the idea of being able to make a journey through life with the help of others and friends is very important. As you, in the art world, you're, you're going to network. Uh, it's very important to have friends. And so this is the image. This is called Poppies. Again, I, the placement is where they were at. I didn't have to do anything for them. It was just... So I have these two globes to show you. Um, the one on the right is McDonald's Dream Globe. Everywhere on Earth, McDonald's is sold. And this is uh, Barbie's Dream Globe, everywhere that Barbie is sold on Earth. If you look at the McDonald's, it, they're even out there on the little islands because of the airports. They, they usually tend to follow with an airport. Um, and you see Cuba doesn't have any there. Um, so you can start to see how uh, political uh, and cultural uh, resistance keeps the culture from spreading in. And uh, so you also know, like on the, on the uh, other side in China, there's no McDonald's in China. There was a McDonald's in China. And then they got rid of the McDonald's in China. And then they brought in a restaurant that's Chinese McDonald's, which isn't really McDonald's, but it's McDonald's. And then Barbie's Dream Globe, you can see where, uh, especially within Africa and the Middle East, how the Barbie doll isn't available. That uh, the Barbie doll can be bought in some of those areas, but not all of those areas. And it becomes, again, about cultural representation of women uh, and the West and how that fits. So that's what uh, this idea of depiction. And then imagined. Uh, we imagine regions that identify as connected through its people. Locations and traditions like important figures, religious poli uh, religions, politics, and sport, but free from areas not connected by these traits. So I want to talk about our imagined, um, what we imagine in terms of identity. This is Mar uh, Marcel Brodhaus. Um, and uh, the image is called uh, the femur of a Belgian man and a French woman. I, again, like Dion, a very simple approach to a complex idea of identity that our identity or nationality could be bone or marrow deep. Yet, you know, we're, we're always changing as individuals by what we experience even outside of where we come from, from, from outside of where we come from. So our identity might be bone deep, but we also, um, we know it very personally and it can be very different to someone else. Um, these are, um, some examples of things I found on my trips. Um, pimp steak, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and the New York pizza in the Netherlands. Now, um, the Netherlands, if you notice, I was eating my pizza, and I got down to the bottom, and you see the grease on it still. And there's a picture, it says New York pizza, and, but there's the, the Statue of Liberty, and she's doing this, this like sobbing, crying in her hands. Like, so this weird cultural critique at the bottom of my pizza, I had no idea I was going to get. Because the pizza was so bad. Maybe. It wasn't a bad pizza. Right? I, it wasn't a bad pizza. But it was this, like, what do people think of like, who we are? Like, wh who's someone in the Netherlands is feeding me a piece of pizza from New York, and, but yet there's this crying Statue of Liberty on it, which we would have never. I mean, it's a, it's a criticism, right? Um, like, she's sad or ashamed. There's a dollar bill f sign floating in. I did not receive the pizza for free. Anyway, so it's a little kind of a, a weird cross argument there. Um, and then pimp steak. I, I like that because it's like, you know, we don't really consider the pimp as a, um, a selling point. Like if I were going to try to sell you a car, I mean, you're not going to come down to pimp's cars, right? No. So, you know, so it's really interesting. I'm, gonna, I'm going back to Amsterdam in a couple weeks. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat a steak at pimp steak. I, I want to. Anyway, just 
But it's like, how do, how, how do other people know who America is? And it's like, what they know is just how we, is this, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a shell of ideas that then they, they, they attribute to their own uh, interests. Here's, here's uh, I'm Amsterdam. This is uh, Scrooge McDuck, and he's, he's trying to sell you a house or buy your home. Yeah. That's, that one's a uh, Carl, from the Carl Marx era. Thank you. Thank you. For those taking notes, please remember that. Uh, I will. Um, so here, you know, here is again this this uh, this um, American greedy miser duck, who is um, now he, he is Amsterdam, right? Yeah. Actually, <coughs> okay. Actually, Scrooge McDuck is actually from Scotland. Okay. Well, believe it or not, I've done some digging on Scrooge McDuck. Yes, he's created by Karl Marx. Yes, and yes, he's a the world's richest duck, but he's from Scotland. Or I. Blaine. Scrooge McDuck, he's got that that Scotsman accent. Uh, right, right. Or how do you explain him a doctor right. by David Tennant? There you go, right? Well, but he is he is an American export. We have to say that he was created and made in and um, you know, he is American. But I, I, I appreciate that and that's great because I'm gonna think about that more. That idea of the accent uh, on the duck and, and how that nationality might play out. But it, again it's, this is in Amsterdam and not Scotland, which is interesting too. Other imagined things like, um, you know, what our powers like. Uh, this is drawing with the stars, uh, an installation view. I did back with uh, we were talking about mac uh, macromedia. I, I made this animation where you could interact, and uh, it was a night sky, spring night sky, and you could rearrange the stars, or you can draw with the stars. And our imagination, you know, I. When we look up at the stars, there are hunters and bears and fish, and you know people have drawn into the stars since the beginning of time. And I'm I'm so far away from that origin that when I look up, I don't really see a hunter or a bull. You know, I can have someone draw it to me and show me what they were saying, but but earlier people saw that. I might see something completely different, but that's the imagination at work and how we start to understand it and understand our world. So culturally, they were attributing things that were within their culture onto the stars. And if we started today with that same conversation, ignoring everything else, we would have a whole different set of imagery associated with the way the stars line up. So I gave everyone that opportunity to do their own thing. Some people would write letters or, or write words with the stars because the stars could leave trails. Um, or you could just rearrange them into masses and groups. And it, it, it was like uh, video games that no one could lose. You know, I was like, well, at the time video games were out, and I was like, well, what if we just have where people just participate? There's no real win or loss. Uh, you win because you, you do it, you know. Um, so we did that. Um, <clears throat> and then this idea of we do have ideals, and then there are contrary ideas, like things that are contrary to those. And we have a place for that, and that's usually jail. You know, you get, you know, if you, you don't act a certain way, you can wind up in, in the who scale. Here is um, an image, and this one definitely is going to be pixelated for you, because I shot it in digital in 2004 with like a four megapixel camera. Um, the, the slides that I took in film did not turn out. So. But this is um, all the odds and normal in the United States. Uh, black, white, black, white, white, black, white, black. Uh, the United States was uh, sign vinyl, and it's in a, um, in a holding cell. This was part of Dave Muller's three-day weekend. Uh, any of you know who Dave Muller the artist is? Dave Muller is from L.A., and, uh, and important. He, he, he shows through Bloom and Poe. Um, and he does, anytime he has an exhibition in, at a museum, he in, comes into the community and invites the artists to be in a show, and it's called a three-day weekend. And then, so I got a chance to be in that. And so this was mine. I, I got a, a jail cell. I did uh, all the odds and normals in the United States, every town or city named Odd Normal. And then on the other side, I did uh, any given number of convicts at any given time, which was just this beautiful kind of abstraction. Uh, this, it was um, Elmer's glue and acrylic paint. Uh, I would pour it on plastic, just as it gets a little like dry, but a little rubbery. I could peel it up and I could cut it into shape and, and glue it down into the space. Uh, any, any more time it'd get too rigid and it'd break and any, too, any less time it'd be too wet. So um, that was um, an interesting project. And it was my first step into installation. 
but I was always making objects and thinking about uh, imaginings. Uh, and I like models, you know, maps, charts, graphs, they're all models. They're just a, a model of a large idea and it's, it's boiled down to something a little simpler that you can understand, a globe. You know, a globe will let you understand the world a little bit easier because it's in front of you. Um, so models are like that. Um, you know, if you, you put together a car model, you get an understanding of how cars go together. Um, in this case, uh, this was called The Last Drive-In Theater on Earth, and I, and I was going to run a movie. Uh, and it would be a tabletop at a projector, and I thought, well, you know, the last one is okay, but like, maybe it could be more positive. And so I, I did the first drive-in theater on Mars. Because I'd rather go with the first or, you know, like what is the potential of the future? And maybe we will need drive-in theaters again, especially for all, you know, using rovers and landers. Um, and so I built it and then I made a movie that projects um, uh, out of the table. You can see where there's a little pigtail that sticks down on the table. I built the table, I built the top. and painted it and made the little lander and made the movie. I, I collaged the movie out of uh, junk mail that came to my house. So I just go out in the morning to the mailbox and take the junk mail out and throw it in a box. You know, and I accumulate that for like months and months and months and then I'd go through and make movies out of them and they would project onto here. And um, this, and I'm gonna, I don't know how loud this is gonna be. I might just remute this. It's a little loud. Yeah, I think it's too loud. I'm afraid. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it's just too loud. I can't take the, I can't bring the volume down. But I want, I want the volume. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna wait until the, I'm gonna wait until the beeps are all done, because these beeps can be annoying. That's okay. So this is called Hero, and there's a blue blob that's kind of the bouncing ball through the movie, and um, it, it, it gets kind of stuck together with uh, the astronaut you just saw fall into the machine. And... Uh, That's a clip of Hero. You can go, see, I'm going to mute this back again because the machines are way too loud on this. Um, you can see that on my website as well, but that's, that's Hero and it's a, it's a longer than that. So time and random data and sequence, um, you know, the data I've been, I've been presenting has been kind of random. Uh, I don't exactly know when races, how races are going to begin or end. Um, I, I don't know how many restaurants McDonald's is going to populate the earth with. Um, so there's a lot of randomness, and I, I, I take the idea of the random data and place it in a, a temporal sequence, like a timeline. So I've done maps, charts, you know, all of this measurement, now I'm down to timelines. And it's a mixture of, I do some in painting and I do some in scientific illustration. So you're going to get to see some handwork here. And the idea was that the temporal clarity would be the closer you are, the sharper you are, the farther away you get, the blurrier you get. And you override this idea of um, information all the time in your, your mind. Okay. So I would, I would go out and do these searches. The first, the last, all of, the final. And Google would give me these search results and I could take this subject matter and put it into a file folder. The, the last image of, the first example of, and that then becomes a narrative component. I can take the first, the last, all of something, and put them together into small narrative titles. 
And then using the, this law of temporal clarity, which I invented, I don't know if it actually exists. It's, it's, different, than, it's different than atmospheric perspective that the, that the Asians gave us uh, in drawing. Uh, because that is pictorial space. This is temporal space. It's different. So it needs a different rule. Um, so this is called The Last Man on the Moon and the Oldest Icon of the First Pope Separated by All the State Flowers of the United States. And it's a scientific illustration. I went back to these black and white drawings because I had been doing this color coding for so long, I wanted to kind of clear my palette and I wanted to think about the concepts more and I thought that the, uh, this bl straight black and white drawing was a way to get down to, to the, the foundation and to move back up again. Uh, so I wanted to clear my head and I did these drawings and, and uh, I love them, uh, but they're, they're really kind of a, a beginning. Uh, let me go back. This one was called, um, with an image of the last battle of the French and Indian War on the, on the horizon, the first image of Mars from Mars is obscured by examples of German butterflies. From the point of archaic tools, the future includes the gun that killed Archduke Ferdinand and the first image of Mickey Mouse. Now this is a passenger pigeon. And the passenger pigeon has a very uh, kind of a sad history. It's a history of loss here in the United States. When uh, we, we came to America, there were so many passenger pigeons that they could black out the sky, that they could land on trees and break them in half because they were such massive, uh, these just amounts of them. And they were, hunted, they were hunted for their feathers and their meat. They became very popular to export the meat and their feathers for fashion. And um, we never thought we would, we would kill them off. But, but this was the last passenger pigeon. Yeah, there is a name. I'm not sure the name. But yeah, it has a name. And, and uh, they stuffed. <laughs> Yes? It makes us wonder, when we wipe out a species, it makes us wonder what kind of animals are we? Good. I'm, I'm right on there with you, right? Edible. What'd you say? Hopefully edible. We could be edible, that's true. We could be. No, it's or not edible. Like I always, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. You're fine. I figured that we're, it's very easy that we become the very savage, <clears throat> sorry. I'm, I'm afraid that sometimes, I think we're, we are easily turning the very vicious, savage, bloodthirsty predators with fear. Well, I, uh, I think that that's a valuable concern. And uh, I think that there's a lot of weight to that. So, um, because if we start thinking about other things that have been pushed near or to extinction, here is, uh, this is an unknown Navajo person um, from the Navajo tribe, and then, um, this is Wild Bill Hickok. Uh, Wild Bill, it was his name, his frontiersman, um, and he was killed, uh, murdered in 1876. He was shot in the back uh, while playing poker. He was playing poker here. And um, while he was playing poker, his hand was this hand. It was the, the dead man's hand. Sometimes it shows it with the card over, and sometimes there's a jack there. Uh, it just depends. And so I'm, I'm showing you this, this, this history. This is an American history, right? This is thoroughly American history. Uh, the passenger pigeon's extinction, the Navajo play, pushed to near extinction, and the death of uh, the front plainsman lawman hero, Wild Bill Hickok. Um, so I was in uh, Hungary. Uh, I was doing a visiting artist lecture like this. Uh, it was at the, at the um, uh, there, there was a Fulbright thing, and we were, we were at uh, the, the National Academy of Science is where I did the lecture. And I was working with students, and I brought them some drawings that I did um, just for Hungary. Now, Hungary, like I said before, is very, you know, it's, it has a very troublesome past, a lot of loss. They, they were, they were uh, the Nazis uh, were horrible. 
Uh, I mean, th their entire history was bad. They just kept being occupied by other uh, forces. Pretty poor country. They don't have a lot in terms of the arts. This mural I had planned for months, and I planned something a little way more challenging. But I could not get through the system in Hungary for them to okay the mural. So I'm landing there, getting ready to go paint something, and we haven't gotten the okay yet. Well, it keeps getting distilled down, a little, little more conservative, a little bit more conservative because of their tastes, which was fine. I liked working with them. I learned a lot. So the students were there, and we worked, and, and they went through my, my website, and they said, we like this drawing. And I asked why. I said, well, this thing in the background reminds us it reminds us of uh, our indigenous uh, craft work. It looks like some of our old blankets. And I thought, OK, well, that's great. That's a connection, right? And when I told them the story of the drawing, they related to it in this deep sense of loss. So this was the final piece. And it was in the psychology building. Uh, at uh, Karoli Gaspar University in Budapest, which it seems kind of like it's just a little painting on the wall, right? But it was a really big step for them. It was a, it was a very big step for them in terms of being able to interact with the arts and to do a, a piece of art that wasn't just in the traditional academic style, that, st that, that a portrait is a portrait or a still life is a still life. It was something greater. Now, an interesting thing about this, I got there and I asked, OK, what kind of budget do we have, right? And they said, well, we don't have any budget, no budget. And I brought a few little paintbrushes with me. And the host managed to buy a small can of black paint, like this big, right? And I said, OK, great. Can we prep the wall and white it out? And they're like, no, we don't have any white paint. I was like, even just to like paint the wall, just white, one white, like you got a closet with some white paint in it? And like, no, we don't have that. We have to budget for everything like that. And so I couldn't make a mistake. I had to just kind of paint all the way through with this. So I stood there for 10 hours painting this, repainting this drawing on the wall. Well, students roamed past me. They would step and, and talk. Uh, I had a couple assistants that would assist. But this was the, um, the final one. But again, just like, like Colombo, you never know when something that is so American is going to be you know, uh, embraced by another country. You just have no idea how that's going to work out. So I'm going to push through these. The final, it was, we see an example of the first phase of Navajo blankets, the dead man's hand, and then the last passenger pigeon placed within their appropriate time relationship using the law of superposition. So that's the title of that piece. It's now on a plaque on the wall in Budapest with that. And then I got color back into it. Uh, the colors of Marvel's most murderous characters float in front of a web made of a spider on marijuana that obscures half of the last and one fourth of the first emperor of China. So firsts and lasts, I like to then that's like one quarter of the first and half of the last. I like to play with that, um, puns. And also this idea that we would, we would subject spiders to drugs to better understand drugs is really weird to me. Uh, one half of King George III and a diagram of cut gems are suspended above fields of the Fantastic Four. Color pastel and white charcoal on paper. These are, these are um, 13 by 16, something like that. And finally, this, this image. So this is why I'm here. Where I'm doing some carving. And we're working with the big robot to carve out some foam. And I'm going to show you the last six pieces I did. And they're relatively new. This is a new process for me. And every process, there has to be some kind of conceptual linkage to the previous archive. And uh, I'm very grateful to be able to come here and to do this. So this is a painting I did on canvas. Now, I was trying to do some canvas because 
I wanted to get larger than the aluminum would let me get. It had to get bigger. Um, but it just started to look like modernist painting. It was on canvas. It just looked like a painting. And even though it was spray paint and whatever. So this is uh, the concept of the Loch Ness Monster and the colors of every Triple Crown winner are seen organized using the law of superposition and are obscured by nine iron men and 15 Chinese flags. Yes? Why the complex names? Those are the things that are in it. And they're just matter of fact. That is um, the, uh, an image of the Loch Ness Monster. And so the idea or the concept of the Loch Ness Monster uh, and then uh, all the Triple Crown winners, those are all the colors that stack. And then um, the red dots with the yellow are either Chinese flags or Iron Men. You can pick which ones you want them to be. I don't care. They're yours. Okay. But so I look at this painting and it's a site, it's a location, just like everything else that I've been looking at, it's a place. It's my position. And it's about time and depth of time. <coughs> but it's a, like a map, like my first map of America that I showed you, it's a flat, abstracted representation of a place. And so I'm considering this the same. Now if we look at this, do we know what this is? You guys know what this is? Yeah. It's, uh Very close. It's the, it's the face on Mars. Yes? It, that's called pareidolia. Great. And yes, you're right. It is a rock formation that when we look at it photographically, we see a face, right? So for the longest time, for 30 years, we thought that there was a in fact, there was legend of Martians carving a big face, right? It was, it was like Mount Rushmore. Right, uh, but uh, on Mars, there's even movies where it became a spaceship. Right, but we know now that it's this. Right, that with better topography and understanding of topography and better technology, we understand that the flat image isn't flat, and it doesn't look exactly like we'd expect it to look. So back to this image. This is my sight. This is my face on Mars. This is, the, this is what we can consider, but we don't truly know. We might know better if we have better technology. And so started doing this. This was um, at, in, at the STEAM facility at the University of North Carolina, Asheville. Uh, I was a residency there just a couple weeks ago. So this is, like I said, it's all brand new, and I'm, and I'm here with Michael. And um, so we would scan the painting, put it through a, another platform to create topography, and you're like, well, how do you know how high the topography should be? Isn't everything you do random? Well, you're right. So if I need a number, I have to pull off on now, I have to pull off on some other kind of random place. So uh, I've been recording all my bowling games uh, for the last couple years. So if I need a random number, I can go to my archive of bowling information and get a number from a, ga from a, from a game or a frame. And that allows me to play with topography. So, uh, this is what we would do. Um, we get the, uh, we get the uh, CNC router going and it would work. Now some of these paintings it would take, um, oh, maybe six or seven hours to cut out. Some would be a little less, but, um, and, and every time that we did it we learned a little bit more in terms of production. Um, but so now I'm building the topography of that flat plane. So you know, if you're on, a, if you're looking at a road map and you're driving across country, the road map is a flat abstraction, and you're on the blue line. But when you're driving, you have hills and terrain, and you have trees, and uh, all of these different um, factors. So wouldn't the painting also have them as well if you were able to drive through it instead of just looking at it flat like an abstraction? So again, this is just one more. And it, this is a half-inch ball. It seems to be a popular. Uh, bit to use, but this is what we used to do them. Uh, high density urethane foam, it's pretty hard. It's like basswood. It's really dense. Um, and so this would be the example of that painting uh, in topographical form. 
uh, without the color. Now, I, I, I'm a painter, so I painted it back right on top of it again. And this is the final example. So we go from that original flat two-dimensional understanding of a site to this more complex understanding of the site as a topographical move. So here are the last few. Uh, we did, um, we did uh, I think, six. So this one is called, OK, now it's called the topographical view of the concept of the Loch Ness Monster and the colors of every triple crown winner seen organized using the law of superposition, which are obscured by nine iron men and 15 Chinese flags. But it's a topographical view. <laughs> topographical view of the first female doctor, the last pharaoh of Egypt, and nine Hello Kitties using the law of temporal clarity. These are, um, the, the last one, this one, oh, yeah, this one is uh, 30 by 40, 30 inches by 40 inches, um, auto enamel uh, on the high density urethane. So I, I use an airbrush and I spray it on. And uh, this is the Hello Kitty. This is a topographical view near the original Ferris wheel. Green Arrow and the first Lone Ranger watched the colors of the most recent Triple Crown winner run. So um, one other thing I want to say about this is that this is, a, um, this is an intentional carving of an abstracted paint drip. So I think it has a connection to Liechtenstein. And I think that there might be even more um, conversation around that. Because I don't, you know, it's in very intentional and might be the first one. And then this one, topographical view of the oldest icon of Jesus, the first appearance of Marvel's Thor, and the colors of the Minnesota Vikings using the law of temporal clarity. And that's another interesting thing, too, is that you know that the Minnesota Vikings and Marvel's Thor they emerged within the same year, within the same year. Also, I think that the oldest icon of Jesus is in the background, and like football is that thing on Sunday that everybody, you know, they have to hurry and get it through church so they can get to the, watch the game. A topographical view of a dozen Homer Simpsons obscure the oldest European fresco of Native Americans and the last US military airship <clears throat> and finally, the topographical view of four occurrences of Kermit floating above colors of the most recent Super Bowl sponsors with a faraway image of the last battle of the American Revolutionary War. This one is 30 by 40 inches. All right, the end. Thank you. Probably have time for some questions, or if anybody wants to stay longer and ask questions, we do ask that if you have a question, speak into the microphone. Uh, yes. Listen, I'm sorry if I don't you know, made my own point of statement, but I want. Oh, I'm sorry. Listen, I do apologize for how I, I didn't mean to. You know, look. No, you're fine. Look, okay. I just want you to know that. Um, look, it wasn't easy for me to really speak what I was about to say. I mean. But why is that about Scrooge McDuck is true? And the same with the past, how, you know, we're, we're causing extinctions or wiping out entire species. Even though scientists are working all they can to try to bring them back through technology, but deep inside, no matter how evolved we are, no matter how intelligent or rational or civilized we are, deep inside there's a part of it that's just this primal, you know, this savageness inside, you know, that makes us become predators ourselves. Well, being, being reflective, that's very important. Right, and I think that that's why we have art, is that we can reflect on these these very important topics like that. So you're you're right. Can I ask a quick question? You sure may. Um, I'm just thank you for the for the talk. It was fascinating. I'm just wondering how important it is for you, for your audience, like for for viewers of your work, to know either the titles at the very least or the um, all of the different layers of, of back back info right well I, I typically try to land in a place where 
a visual aesthetics that there's a value to it. So if, if you're in a gallery or museum and you encounter my work, you might just be interested in the aesthetic formal abstraction of it or the imagery that's apparent. So in that case, that audience will be rewarded for, by that experience. If you're more invested or involved in the arts or you might read something about my work, you would come to that with some understanding of where the work comes from. So if you were to say, go to the Pompidou Center and see um, Marcel Brodhars's, uh bones, you may not understand where that comes from until you, you read the title. And then it, even after you read the title, then there's probably even some more research to be had. So I think that uh, art, what I, what I hope is that I produce an object, uh, that my practice produces an object that can be valued by those who are initiated and those who are less initiated into the form. Yeah. I think you said something about realism in the early part of your talk, right? And I mm -hmm. think you were referring to philosophical conceits of the work that you were drawing on, realism being one of them. Mm -hmm. Would you say, I mean, you're playing a lot of games with realism. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, on one level, you just use the word abstraction. Mm -hmm. And yet, at the same time, I'm curious to ask you if you consider yourself a realist painter I, I the find 21st I'm a, century. I'm a referential abstractionist. You know, my, my abstraction tends to... Uh, have a referent in it, so it's it's not non-objective. Uh, however, I feel like I have in my position as the artist, I have the uh, privilege to oscillate between representation and abstraction, and to not really consider them as opposites, but by that they're actually matters of distance, it, procedural, uh, perceptual, and physical. So I don't try to draw too much of a difference between realism and abstraction, knowing that they are just ways of explaining the same thing. And it depends on who you are uh, as an artist and how you might describe them that way. But I think that as humans, we, we, we navigate both simultaneously. That sim simultaneity of driving using a map is this hand-in-hand -hand reality abstraction working together. So. Um, Within my work, that's how that, that is handled. Hi. Hi. Uh, one thing I'm curious about is how important are your color choices? Is that something you like to keep random, or do you are you thinking about color when you're choosing your subject matter and what to layer together? Great. Well, what's what's nice about the appropriation is that most colors are handed to me. In, in both in the amounts and the sequences. And so that's why I've also come up with different rules to allow for the uh, compositional decisions. Once again, I'm trying to shoo that idea of the genius. It's like, you know, I went through school thinking, like I was kind of poor and I figured if somebody could do it, I could do it. That's how I thought about it. But then once you get into it, you realize, well, then if I can do it, then somebody else can do it, right? So I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm just like everybody else. I'm on that same equal plane. So I. When it comes to appropriation or use of color, um, it depends on how I organize it, but usually I play with uh, humor or language. Um, that might help uh, decide which information goes with which information. It, in, in the end, it depends on which point also I'm in placing the viewer. If you are in the past or in the future, it's depending on clarity and what information is going to be presented clear. Uh, yeah, so, so the, the game is always how can I avoid the, the decision? Um, how can I let the process make the decision? And people ask me, is this a performance? And I really feel like it's a practice. A performance is something I, kind of, you, I feel like you step in and step out of. And the way that I make my work is kind of a constant ongoing observation and making that it never really stops. Uh, but people will say that I kind of present it as almost like a lecture of performance, but it really is kind of a reflection of practice. Okay. All right, great. Thanks, everybody. Oh, we have a question. No. Yeah, no Some question. class has to go, I think. So if you need to go, go ahead. And we'll continue. I will leave my class outside. Um, but, but, Okay. I just want Hi. Um, okay. If you want your paper back, I'm going to stand outside with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, and is there an attendance sheet? Yeah. Oh, okay. We bring, uh, yeah.
Um, so I was wondering about the um, blocks that you make out of like the different layers of like iconic things like um, mm -hmm. the Steamboat Willie and the Mickey Mouse and the Hello Kitty. Yes. I was wondering how you make those layers of the colors. Like do you layer them and they mix together or do you do them separately? That's a good question. Well, what that block you saw was a box that was um, made of uh, MDF or medium density fiberboards like a wood. And then I used my airbrush and I would paint the stripe around and then make the next stripe and I would paint it around and paint it around until I had all of those stripes painted all the way up. Um, it, it's kind of freehand because uh, a taped edge would be too sharp. You know, I want a fuzzy edge. Um, so I'd have to freehand and it, it would take some time. There's a little bit of skill in that um, because you might get around three sides but then that fourth side doesn't just, the line doesn't kind of line up so you have to figure, you know, work that out. So uh, yeah, it was, it was hand painted, spray pa spray air sprayed by uh, by hand with airbrush. Yeah. Richard, use the microphone. What program did you use to make Hero? Uh, Hero was made with um, that was made with Macromedia Director and Flash. I think that was made in two thousand and five or seven, somewhere in that. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, it was, it was actually bought. Does, but, yeah. But even that is a Yeah, right. That's old. Yes, but I, I liked, I, I really liked the, the, the way the timeline and animation worked in uh, Macromedia Director. Um, it was very intuitive for me. If you had to do it again today, what program would you use? Well, you know, there's like a lot more now, right? You can pick a lot, right? I mean, even Illustrator, you can do animation in Illustrator. So, um, you know, it, it's basically how do, you, how do you put together a collage? How did Terry Gillum do it? He did it with film. You know, so I, I look at, I go back to those collagists and I, I think how do they make them? So everybody uses a different tech to make the, move, the, the images work together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Great, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you.